Well, I think it is 2 o'clock here, and uh, welcome back for round two here. Uh, is there anybody that wasn't here yesterday? So you all repeat customers. Well, that's good. I was wondering if you all come back or find something more interesting to do this afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Geo Richards, and uh, we're talking about new developments in combustion technology. And yesterday we covered some things related to ways that you might do carbon dioxide management essentially with no penalty, chemical looping combustion. It's a very interesting topic. It's a lot more chemical engineering, and I have to admit I go around telling people I meet for the first time, although I'm a mechanical engineer, I spend most of my time doing chemical engineering anymore because of projects like that. And so I can't tell jokes about chemical engineers anymore. It's my favorite hobby. So I pick on lawyers instead, but anyway, all right. I thought they'd get around from this audience. Um, the thing you're looking at there, which is bouncing back and forth, we're going to talk about in this first session, a rotating detonation combustion device. And uh, actually, I'm feeling very insecure talking about this because the world's leading authorities are in the room with us today on this subject. So when I get in trouble, I've made a deal that they'll bail me, bail me out. I'll pay whatever is required. But there in the back row, Fred Schauer, who I'm going to acknowledge a couple times I give this talk, has really been a pioneer in this area. And uh, so I'm thanking him in advance. And uh, actually, one of our new postdocs, Arnaud Roy, is sitting down here in the front. He's working with us at our lab on this topic. So uh, he probably already knows a lot more than I do. So he may help bail me out as well. But anyway, uh, we're going to go through this today, and we'll learn a little bit about uh, this topic. And in the second session, we're going to talk about one of my really interesting, favorite, and fun topics of something called direct power extraction. But we'll save that for the second half of the afternoon. So I said yesterday we had covered you know, that chemical looping area. Today, these other two topics, uh, step change in combustion efficiency. So we'll jump right into that. I used this slide yesterday to introduce the idea if people are worried about energy use, either from the standpoint of CO2 emissions or just from conserving resources, then obviously you want to do something in that box of being able to change the generator efficiency. That would take you a long way towards improving the, the overall efficiency, even if you had to do carbon dioxide capture or management. On, I, oh, there's my pointer. So. Uh, that was my point yesterday, and we'll come back to this slide again at the end and make some more comments about it. But today, our, our focus for right now, can we make a big jump in generator efficiency to offset the penalty if we had to do carbon dioxide capture? So we're going to focus on turbines because turbines are really becoming the workhorse for power generation, particularly here in the U.S. All right, as you saw yesterday, Probably about 40% of our electric energy in the U.S. today comes from coal, either burning pulverized coal or fluid bed combustors. But turbines are taking over a large and larger portion of that power generation for one very clear reason. We have a lot of natural gas in the United States right now. It's very inexpensive because what you know people commonly refer to as the shale gas revolution. You can put just about any fuel you want in a turbine. Obviously, in flight, you have propulsion fuels there for that application. But on the ground, you can just use about anything you want. Right? There is a way to use almost all those fuels, including solid coal. Right? You gasify that coal, coal synthesis gas, and then you can use it in a gas turbine. And you may not be aware there are a number of so-called integrated gasification combined cycle, IGCC. They're coal plants. They gasify the coal. They run it in a combined cycle gas turbine. How many in the room know what a combined cycle gas turbine is? About half, so I'll take a moment, just a second, okay? Uh, and just so you have a clear picture, the number of IDCC plants is relatively small relative to the total population of power plants, so four or five maybe in the U.S. right now. Well, this one in construction in, in Mississippi, and there's another in, in Indiana that's currently going through commissioning uh, issues right now. So not a lot of them, but my point again is, if we develop it for natural gas, we could also adapt it later to coal. That shale revolution, all right, look at the projections here. This was from a Wall Street Journal article. You know, this, this forecast international anticipates 12,054 turbines will be sold in the coming decade. 
how did they know it was 5'4"? <laughs> it's kind of, kind of ridiculous, isn't it? They never took a class in significant figures, or I don't know, must have been a lawyer. All right, anyway, uh, so there's going to be a lot of gas turbines used driven by the low cost of natural gas. That's the point of this slide. So we want to use the power, we want to generate power from those turbines as efficiently as we can. Right, that makes sense, both from a CO2 standpoint and conserving a valuable resource. I put a plot together uh, showing combined cycle gas turbine lower heating value efficiency versus a year for, for gas turbines that are used to generate electric power. And I, I'm amazed because it's, it's virtually linear over time with, a, with a, an efficiency percentage of about a half a percent per year over those decades. In reality, if you go in and look at the details of how that unfolded, it did not occur like a half percent this year, a half percent next year. How did it occur? It occurred with a stepwise change like somebody improved cooling, somebody came up with a thermal barrier coating, but when you integrate that, those developments out over a course of 20, 30 years, it turns out to be about a half a percent per year. So if you wanted to get 5% increase in efficiency, just go on vacation for 10 years, maybe not, all right? Because a lot of those material advances, cooling advances, they've really been worked, right? I mean, and so some people say, well, how much higher can you go if on that traditional route? I don't know. We should still keep working it. I think we're going to see continued development, you know, by making improvements in materials and in, in aerothermal heat transfer. We've got work at our lab going on looking at some of these issues. But the point I really want to make on this slide, that's an impressive efficiency, but it's still very well below the potential you could get if you just say, well, how good could I do if it was a heat engine operating at that temperature, right? Well, you know, there's the Carnot efficiency at you know, a turbine inlet temperature is 1600 centigrade, 84 percent, we're at 61. There is room to go, right? So I'm, I'm not violating any rules here by saying there's got to be a way to get that efficiency up. So how can I actually do something to jump above this line and not have to wait 20 years for advances in materials that might or might not be there to move that number up? So what can you do to jump above the efficiency line that's historical right there? That's the question. Well, a step change in efficiency. Now, some of you uh, said you're not familiar with a combined cycle, but I'm going to assume you're all familiar with a gas turbine, all right? You take air through a compressor, you burn fuel in a combustor, and then you expand through a gas turbine. If you want to make a combined cycle, you take that gas at relatively high temperature and then run it through a steam generator and then power a steam turbine on the bottom. And that's why it's called a combined cycle, right? Because you have a, a Brayton cycle here, a Rankin cycle down there. You put those two things together. The gas turbine takes the highest temperature gas, generates some energy from it. The heat that it rejects, because it's a heat engine, then goes into the next cycle down at the bottom, right? And so that's why it's called a combined cycle. And that's why these are the most efficient generators around, because you're combining these two cycles that have just a remarkable synergy when you put them together. So combined cycle efficiency is above 60%. But if I wanted a step change in efficiency, you know, it's logical to say, well, where are the biggest losses in even that nice combined cycle? Where are the big losses that I've got to work with? All right. So for those of you who study, you know, exergy or thermodynamic availability, I don't know how they teach thermodynamics anymore, but I know when I went through it was as kind of a chapter and just sort of pushed it aside, but it is pretty important to take a look at the thermodynamic availability. You know, thermodynamic availability, like if I take my car top of a hill, right, and let the brake off, and I just roll to the bottom, it's now got a lot of kinetic energy, haven't lost any energy. Now I step on the brakes, I still haven't lost any energy. It shows up as heat, you know, on the, the brakes. But I can't do anything with it at that point. It's no longer available, right? Well, we have the same issue in combustion and other technologies that you know, we're interested in. You destroy the availability with different processes going around this. And so I took this chart out of this book by uh, Bijan, and he actually calculates the destruction of available energy in the different components in actually, it wasn't a combined cycle, but it doesn't matter here. And if you look at the percentage of the exergy that's destroyed in each of these processes, so for example, the compressor, it's pretty efficient, right? You know that. It's almost isentropic compression. The turbo expander isn't much different. It's also very efficient. Even the recuperator in that system, pretty efficient recovery of the available energy. 
the biggest loss, the biggest destruction of exergy is in combustion. All right, so that's why you think, well, maybe that's something we should work on. Try not to wreck all the available energy by burning the fuel. I was interviewed by a magazine recently, and I had to actually ask them not to print this because I said, <clears throat> well, you know, the worst thing you can do with fuel is burn it. And y'all know what I mean, right? Because you're wrecking the exergy. I didn't want it going into print somewhere because people wouldn't understand that who weren't trained in thermodynamics. You see what I'm saying? All right. You heard the joke about uh, what's the problem with entropy? It just isn't what it used to be, right? <laughs> so, so we worry a little bit about entropy and exergy destruction in the combustion system, all right? What can I do about it, right? That's an interesting question. I think, well, I got to figure out how to get rid of that extra destruction in the combustor. Well, there is something you can do about it, all right? We sort of take this for granted until maybe you look at this area. Uh, you could come up with a different engine cycle, right? That's what a, how a combined cycle works. That's why it's more efficient. But you could actually change the combustion so you end up with a different cycle. So this is not a cycle here. I want to be clear on that. It's just I'm showing combustion, but I'm trying to get to a different cycle embodiment, which would have higher efficiency than the one I'm used to looking at. All right. So let's take a look at combustion proper. Uh, this is an example of uh, how effective my art skills are here. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't go into artwork, but I'm trying to show a flame anchored in a combustor. All right. So the gas is flowing through that nice blue flame right there. And the way you would do that in a gas turbine, it's constant pressure, right? There's some pressure drop going through the combustor, but let's not worry about losses right now. Ideal case, almost constant pressure moving through the combustor. You know, gas turbine conditions here, 30 bar, 600 K inlet. I come out the other side, 1600 Kelvin, not too high temperature, but anyway, so I can, you know, do the thermodynamics. The change in enthalpy for combustion equals the heat in, the CP delta T equals that heat in, and so you get these conditions coming out the other side. Now, if I don't let the stuff flow through there, if I just put the same fuel air into a box and close both ends and light it, well, it's a different story, all right? The thermal balance here is the change in internal energy equals the heat that you've put in, and so right away you see the ratio of CP to CV, you're going to get a higher temperature and, of course, a lot higher pressure, right? And that's where the phrase pressure gain comes from. So this is nothing, you know, too far out, right? You burn fuel in a box, and you have high pressure available to you, available energy. So you see right away, if I just burn it at constant pressure, I've thrown away all that expansion work against the environment. I didn't get anything back for it. If I put it in a box and burn it, boom, now I've got to do something with that available energy that's there in, the terms, of, in terms of higher pressure. If uh, I'm careless after I do the combustion here and just expand that out of a nozzle, free expansion, I'll come back to the constant pressure case, just, you know, kind of conservation of energy. So if it's an unrestrained expansion, you're going to come down to this condition, and other than making some noise, there's no benefit, right? So the key is if I'm going to take advantage of constant volume combustion to do something productive with that availability, I've got to be careful how I expand that flow or I'll just lose all that availability, and I think you all appreciate that. So how do you actually do that is what we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon. So, so far I've just talked about the combustion itself being constant volume. Now we're going to insert it into a turbine engine cycle. So with a conventional engine compressor, uh, you have a little bit of pressure loss going through the combustion chamber and expansion through the turbine. Here, if you could find a way to do it constant volume, the pressure is going to rise at that point. If I can recover that, that pressure increase, expand through the turbine, I can produce more work. And so if you put that, for example, on a temperature entropy diagram, Here's the conventional Brayton cycle, constant, uh, constant pressure heat addition here, expansion through the turbine, back to the initial condition, compress, and around that part of the cycle. You could also then plot what happens, and it's called the Humphrey cycle. If you add the heat with constant volume, you can see you're at a higher state here, and drop back down. There's more work coming out on that line from there to there. And you can do the same thing on the, the PV diagram. Uh, you know, there's my joke about entropy right there. The idea is, of course, you don't have as much entropy just lost. You, know, you actually do something useful with it by, by using constant volume combustion. All right. This is not, go ahead. So, 
this higher temperature right here. Yeah, don't forget you're going to expand the flow though too. And you can also, it's, it's the amount of work you're going to get out per unit of fuel. So you don't necessarily have to raise this peak temperature at this point. You could limit it there and still have a higher efficiency. All right, there's a number of ways you can configure that. Excellent question. Well, this, this idea is not new of doing constant volume combustion. It has been around over a century. Uh, it actually dates back to some of the first ideas about gas turbines. Pistons or piston engines already do this. If you're in the classes running through this morning, right, you realize you add heat while that piston is constraining the fluid. Temperature goes way up, right? It's exactly what you said. You get this momentary high temperature and then you expand down and, and you can get high efficiency out of a simple cycle arrangement, right? So that, that's why piston engines have an advantage in simple cycle configurations. Early gas turbines use the same concept of constant volume combustion, and they actually called them explosion turbines. And uh, this is from a 1922 journal article where they were talking about, what's the word they call it, the Halsworth uh, turbine. It had a compression ratio of 2.2 atmospheres, so that was what the compressor was putting in. And then kaboom, you know, you'd have this explosion pressure of 17 atmospheres. Isn't that impressive? How'd you like to stand next to that when it was running? I wish I could have seen that thing running. But they did develop it, and uh, I don't know how many were actually used. But it's an interesting example of exactly what we're talking about today. They did reduce it to practice. Uh, other people realized that rather than having that, you know, expansion that they had to recover the, the fluid from constant volume combustion, they could actually put a piston engine as a topping part of the cycle. And so you have constant volume combustion there and then expand and extract work from those pistons and still have heat left over to go through the turbo machinery on the bottom, almost like what you do on a turbocharger today, except they'd pull work out of the shaft down here. So there's a piston engine with uh, you know, a compressor flowing in an expander coming out isn't any different than, like I said, a turbocharger, except you're getting work off the shaft. So it's another example, and if you go back through and look at the history of this engine, it did have very good specific fuel efficiency. I mean, it was a, a good engine in that regard. It also was a parts hog, <laughs> from at least reading the accounts, because you had a reciprocating engine and a gas turbine stuck together, and you're trying to operate them together, so they had some maintenance issues going on with it, and eventually they stopped making them. The idea of doing constant volume combustion was eclipsed by really improvements you could make with constant pressure combustion devices. That's why I think people started to lose interest because they realized maybe there were other ways that they could exceed those benefits more quickly just by developing the basic gas turbine cycle. So that raises the question, well then why would we be looking at this right now? Well, a couple things there. I just said you know, we're, we're really reaching up to the plateau of what we know how to do with the materials and turbo machinery. I'm not saying we can't make other big improvements, but it might be time to look at how do you make a big step change in the whole engine cycle. And the part in blue right here, you know, I said I gave portions of this lecture before, so I, I repeated what I put in 2012 inside the box here. This is an interesting story. You know, I shared at that time this interview with the guy who is the vice president at, at GE Research, and he talked about you know, this constant det detonative combustion uh, being put in an engine cycle, 30% fuel efficiency improvement, all right? And then in terms of efficiency, something we deal with more in, you know, ground power, maybe five to 10 percentage points increase in efficiency was what he was projecting. So that means like you go from 59 to 65% jump in efficiency of an engine, just remarkable when he concedes there might be other ways to get there, but there's nothing else you could do to just take you there in one gigantic step. So a lot of interest there. Uh, you know, and interesting on this point he makes on the bottom here, although there's a lot of work going on for propulsion applications, his comment here, it's going to be easy to do this first in a land-based application, which is why myself, my colleagues, Department of Energy, right, we're busy thinking about this because we understand that as well. By the way, remember that point for when I ask a hard question later, what he said there, be, be handy, it'll make sense out of the talk later. Uh, this was Sam Mason, I didn't hear this quote, Fred uh, passed it on to me, 5% pressure loss, it's typical of an engine today, 5% pressure gain, it's like doubling the compression ratio. You think about that, I mean, well, how significant that would be on an engine. You know, double the compression ratio without having to add all those parts. 
So again, for flight applications, wow, really some significant potential there. So that was what I said in 2012, and apparently the talk was so compelling and so stunning that somebody noticed. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing a little. I don't know that anybody was listening, but people are paying attention to this technology. All right. Here's an article that was produced early this year in Mechanical Engineering, December, and Gas Turbine World. I didn't think I'd see that. All right. Gas Turbine World is the journal that people do gas turbines for electrical power. It's, it's kind of a nuts and bolts magazine. You know, not a lot of technical detail. Lead article on you know pressure gain combustion for, for gas turbines. So I saw both these, I was like, wow, <laughs> that's interesting. People really are recognizing this is a potential technology. It's why we're talking about it with this audience. Maybe some of you will have a chance to work in it and we've got some people in the audience that are. So uh, we'll see how it goes. We gotta solve some of the technical problems with it. Uh, there are a number of ways that you could do pressure gain combustion and we're just gonna cover all of them for fun. Uh, there's a, approach that uses uh, a deflagration and then the other side looking at uh, detonations or even a fast deflagration. So we'll talk through uh, what each one of these are and there's even a few more here. This is not a comprehensive list but it'll give you an idea that there's different ways you could approach this problem. Okay, so pulse deflagration. So this, the idea of pulse deflagration doesn't require uh, a large uh, detonation in the combustion. It's conventional deflagration combustion and one way to embody that is with uh, a so-called aerovalve or even mechanically valved combustion chamber. And so if you configure a chamber like this with a, a long enough exit and a short enough inlet, it's not symmetrical all right, in terms of geometry and it's also not symmetrical in terms of the, the conditions of the flow this diagram doesn't do it justice, but typically here, all right, this is the colder inlet end, so the gas is dense, all right? So if you suddenly increase the combustion rate and the pressure rises, it's hard for that gas to get out of the way. This is less uh, dense down in this region, and the fact that it's longer starts a slug of momentum that keeps things flowing out the end. So qualitatively, that's how the device is gonna work. Combustion rate increases, it uh, starts driving gas really in both directions, but the extra momentum from the previous cycle here tends to reverse it all and keep it pulling down if you do the design properly. And so on average, as you go forward through then the reinjection of additional air and then combustion again and take you around the cycle, you can actually pump the gas through there. And the fact that you're moving the gas through it self-aspirated means you've got a workable pressure gain, all right? Because that's you're creating work on the flow without intervening with the combustion process. Can you actually do that? Yeah, there's, there's been you know, situations where people have made cycles like that work. I hate to admit that I did this work back in 1991, because uh, that seemed like so long ago now, but uh, we, I literally just pulled the figures from some of the rigs that we were running at that time. So you've got to remember the time frame here. We didn't have a lot of computational tools to help us with design. So there was a lot of empirical work just to get a design that operated and actually achieved a pressure gain. So, I mean, literally we did empirical, you know, swapping out parts here to start to home in on a design that would allow you to achieve pressure gain. We, we needed, found we weren't very good empiricists, so we just put together a characteristic time model. And uh, I'm putting this up for a reason because it's interesting just to think about where we're at today if I had to do this same project now, how I would approach it. At that time, we couldn't compute you know, the dynamics include the combustion. So we just put together character time scales for all the different processes, scaled them with the geometries that, you know, existed in the device. And to be honest, I was really surprised because we ran that character. Oh, <laughs> here's an, uh, you know, we, we didn't have CFD at that time. The computer looked a little better than the one I'm showing there in 91, but frankly, not much better. All right, we were really limited. And uh, so we had that characteristic time model, put it together and ran it on a couple of cases, and I'm just showing here the RMS pressures that we actually measured in the lab versus the predictions versus combustion airflow for, uh, let's see, that's the pressure across the inlet and that's the oscillating pressure. And even though there were large gaps in the actual quantitative numbers, we got all the trends right. In fact, to the point where we homed right in on with the model what we needed to do to get pressure gain. So, you know, if you have to get started, 
don't have a big computer, you can do it that way. And we actually achieved in the lab not a very significant pressure gain, about a half a percent. And that's you know, shown here, plotted against airflow. And the other thing is it was only at one condition, right? So it, it wasn't huge, but it, it showed us we could at least get pressure gain. And so we started to press on and go into a pressurized rig to see, well, if I was going to do this in a turbine, could I actually achieve decent pressure gain? So we put together a high pressure rig and ran it uh, up at different pressures. And you know, I'm, it's not all that interesting to go through this data at this point, but just say, we got some pressure gain you know, at certain conditions. We were able to scale it with pressure. Uh, but the results weren't compelling enough to say we should pursue this. And actually, right at the time we were doing this work, Lean premix combustion was introduced to the gas turbine community. Does anybody work gas turbines? How many gas turbine people we got here? Just a couple. All right, so lean premix combustion came into the gas turbine community right while we were working on this technology. And what ended up happening was combustion dynamics just hammered that engine introduction, all of them. And here we were working on unsteady combustion at right that time. So I spent the next 10 years of my career doing combustion dynamics. And we looked at a lot of engines that were shaking, not to get pressure gain. They didn't want it. And every one of them would say, we don't like your pressure gain stuff because I don't want my engine shaking. It's, it's wrecking my warranty agreement. <laughs> you know? So we switched and we worked combustion dynamics for that period of time. And actually, Tim Lewin, who if you'll be here tomorrow, will talk to you about that topic over the next three days. And Tim's just really, really you know, an expert in that area. So I think you're going to benefit from that. But we did combustion dynamics after this. And just walked away from pressure gain at the time because of these other issues. So that's sometimes how research goes. We did uh, sort of leave and stop at that point, knowing there were some challenging problems if we would have continued. These aren't insignificant issues. How do you predict a design that'll, that will even as to oscillate? Right? That's still a hard task all right, to do, even with what we know today, to just say, I know this design will oscillate. In fact, it usually happens the other way around. You try to design a stable system, and it oscillates. And then you're going backwards trying to, to undo that. Uh, but there has been a lot of progress on that. But even if you get a design that oscillates, the next question is, how do you make it achieve pressure gain? Well, what's the parameters that you pick to achieve a level of pressure gain? As far as I know, even today, there's still no fundamental theory that says, here are the parameters that you must pick to get pressure gain. This has not been done. So for some of you, if you're you know, wondering about maybe a research topic that's interesting, this might be one of them if you wanted to go after that. I think you know, to actually do this well, modern CFD, right? you would find a way to use CFD to guide you to that design. But again, that has not been done that I know about. But the other piece that's challenging here, even if you get a, a pulse deflagration that produces a pressure gain, what do you do with it? How do you capture that unsteady flow? Um, Rob Miller at Cambridge uh, gave me this slide, and I, I communicated with him right before this lecture. I, I was not able to update this, but uh, he said he's been making good progress. They've been looking at how do you take the exit, the unsteady flow from that combustor, and then direct it into turbo machinery. How do you turn it? So you can actually recover the kinetic energy of that flow in the turbo machinery. And what you're seeing on the slide here, the color represents the pressure gain. In other words, the, the stagnation uh, pressure that's in the flow right at that point. And you can see the color scale here, 0.1 is 10%. So you know these yellow regions are up in here, maybe about 5% or so. And so the trick is, how do you actually keep that uh, surviving as you move the whole flow through the turbo machinery? I don't have a specific update for you on this. I communicated with him. He says, I'm just, we're getting ready to do some tests, so he wasn't able to update me. But very interesting work on how do you actually use this in a real engine system. Uh, Dan Paxson at NASA is also one of the uh, real lead people in this area. And he's been working on pulse deflagration pressure gain systems for a number of years. Actually used a very small and simple pressure uh, uh, pulsating combustor, it's actually reed valves. So rather than just a, an open pipe, you have a valve on there that, that keeps the flow from going backward. And he put it together with a small uh, turbocharger turbine. And uh, he's been, been getting combustor pressure ratios and uh, 1.035, so about 3.5% increase in pressure going through the system. And he's been looking at important issues like NOx emissions. He gave me a, a video here, which I'm going to show. I have to actually pull out of the presentation for a second. 
just because I, I thought this video just showed what actually happens as you're trying to, you know, capture that pressure gain. If I, if I can only get it to run, here we go. Play. Please do that. Okay, there it is. Get that thing out of there. I don't know how to make this go away. <laughs> uh, we'll just look at it with it there. So you can see there's the, the combustor in this region accelerating the flow out of the end. And what he's looking at is adding, oh, adding an ejector. I, I apologize. I don't know how to use my computer well enough here. Okay, so you can see the high speed flow is being diffused into this ejector and actually it, nothing else happens down in that region. It basically diffuses the flow and what it's doing then is drawing the surrounding flow in and so that's how you're actually using the pressure gain. So you can see even though it's an unsteady flow you have a shot at actually recovering that energy and then using it downstream in, in turbo machinery. Okay, back to the slides here. All right, so what I've explained up till now, pulse deflagration, pressure gain combustion. You don't have a, a high pressure rise like in a detonation. But there's a whole other approach, and that is to actually use a detonation. We'll spend a little bit more time on this. And the idea with using a detonation, because it's moving faster than the speed of sound down that tube, it traps the gases behind it. It's like a piston, right? And so you get really high pressure rise you know, behind that and that allows you to achieve higher pressure gains. Uh, that's that point there. Much higher pressure gains are possible. By the way, I think, I'm not sure about this, maybe somebody will help me, but I think this is the only constructive you know, use for a detonation that people are focused on. I don't know if there are any others, but it, it, it's an interesting point to think about. Usually when you say detonation, you're trying to you know, wreck something, but here we're talking about taking a detonation and use it for something productive. So. If anybody hears of anything else, let me know. So here's how these cycles work. It's a little bit like the pulse deflagration, but uh, you know, you imagine taking a tube here, open a valve, fill it with fuel air mixture, close the back end, start a you know combustion at that point. You have to have a, a transition from a deflagration right at the beginning up to a detonation, and so then you have this detonation wave traveling down that tube. That thing propagates at the so-called C.J. Chapman Jouguet. I hope I pronounced that right. Velocity, the C.J. velocity, and uh, it's moving down that tube. There are some rarefactions that exist behind it. Eventually, it gets right to the end of the tube, so you're left with this chamber full of high temperature and high pressure gas that then gives a big huff out the back end, which you can think right away there's going to be a lot of thrust from that, right? That's the pressure gain, all right? So you want to capture that mechanical energy, do something productive with it. After you're done with that, then rarefaction empties the rest of that tube. You're left with an empty tube again. You open the valve and you go through it again. And this is the work that Fred Schauer, I mean, really pioneered at, uh, at AFRL. And uh, I put this slide together from some photos that, that uh, he provided me with. So you can see, you know, they have four tubes right here. A uh, little bit glowing red there. The front end of this thing, the valve assembly, literally cylinder head of an automobile. Very simple mechanical design. Really cool to see that. Thing ran great uh, and it produces thrust directly. No turbo machinery. I mentioned conventional engine valve assembly for the inlet. And they got this thing all the way to flight demonstration, which I just, <laughs> I should have asked Fred to show the movie about how they put this together. Maybe he's got it, with, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but it's really an interesting story how they did that. Key scientific issue, all right, how do you optimize deflagration to detonation, right? Because remember I said you start back in here, you're gonna light that fuel, it's not a detonation. So you got a period of time where that wave is starting to march forward and build up to a real detonation. All the while you're doing essentially heat addition at almost constant pressure. So you're losing the, the, you're losing the value of what you put together if you wait too long for that transition to detonation, right? Well, how do you get it to transition faster? Well, you could put you know, obstacles in there and there's a number of things if you read the literature that you could do, but every one of those adds a loss, right? So there's a trade-off, a balance that you need to play there in terms of the development of, of that as a concept. Uh, this idea of putting a pulse detonation tube 
you know, in for propulsion has been taken even further and say, well, could I put it in an action, actual engine cycle? All right, so again, this gets back to a gas turbine where you're putting this in right in place of the existing gas turbine and you get this pressure rise through the combustion chamber. And uh, this Vulcan program actually attempted to do that, worked through a number of different phases here, combined the PDE with the turbo machinery. I'll show on the next slide, this has been done in a couple land-based applications. And that program's wrapped up, uh, and so you can actually look up information because I think some of that was declassified. But the focus was try to get it onto a shipboard application. I don't think they've got quite to that point yet, but the technology has really been quite developed. And in fact, on ground-based power, General Electric now, actually quite a few years ago, it's 2007 date there, they put a series of these pulse detonation tubes together and timed them and then ducted them into a, you know, a conventional turbo machinery design. And uh, there were eight tubes you know, put in a single stage axial turbine. They ran this thing for what, over two hours. And the turbine performance, this was a big question, could you put this unsteady flow into the turbo machinery and get decent performance out of the turbo machinery? At least what they saw, it didn't really have that big of an effect, detrimental effect on the turbine performance. Turbine life might be a different story. That wasn't a point of the, the study here, but uh, it was an encouraging result. Take a look at the frequency here, by the way, 20 hertz. So that's sort of typical of what you'd expect, you know, for a detonation leaving a tube you got to fill. So it's pretty low frequency if you use pulse detonation tubes. That's something just to remember for a little bit later as we work through this. Uh, I want to mention some of the work that was done at GE. It was not GE exclusively, but uh, the NASA NASA had a program, constant volume combustion engine cycle program. So we're quite interested that you know people are trying these in ground-based power. So now I want to take a few minutes and dig in a couple of details here that I, I think are interesting and, and help you understand conceptually why would you want to put a detonation in an engine cycle? Right, what's the thermodynamic advantage? I was talking with some people that were doing so-called cycle performance calculations with detonations. I was trying to explain to them they were going to do a calculation for performance with a detonation inside of an engine cycle. And so I explained, now you want this constant volume combustion, you're going to go through and do this, and they says, oh, okay, well how much extra energy do I need to put in to drive the detonation? So I realized I'm just not a good instructor, right? Because I, I couldn't get the point across, it doesn't work that way. You're not putting any extra, you're getting something extra out, all right? But I could see this person asking me, it's because they didn't catch the fundamental idea of how this works. So I don't want to come here and leave you in that same boat, because it was the first time I explained the whole thing, thought it was really clear, and they're just like, how much extra fuel do I got to put in? None. <laughs> That's the point, all right? So I'll try and explain this in a way that I thought would be helpful, all right? So let's take this simple example here. I'm just going to look at two different tubes, one closed and one open, but they're all going to start at the same condition, just filled with fuel and air. All right, same stoichiometry, same stoichiometry in both tubes. And then you light both ends, all right, and let's say you get an immediate transition to a detonation. So this lower sketch shows what's going to happen, or what will become constant volume combustion, right? It's just closed. Boom, <laughs> after a little bit of noise, you're done. And now you have constant volume combustion. The one on the top is open, so if both of these devices are going to release the same amount of heat, burn the same amount of fuel, but the top device has significant mechanical energy as the detonation gets to the end, doesn't it? And so does the bottom one, except the bottom one, I just throw the availability away, right? The top one, you've got all that mechanical energy that's available right as that thing is getting to the end, and now the question is, how am I going to get it out of there and do something productive with it? So this is a really important, like, conceptual understanding. These are two different things. Constant volume combustion versus a, you know, detonation wave. They're two different things because they produce more available. You have avail the same available energy right up to this point, but this one, I'm saying now I'm going to pull that available energy out as mechanical work and do something with it. All right. So to my friend that was unclear about this, I need to go back and kind of go over It's like, you don't need to put more fuel in there because one of them, you're actually going to get the mechanical energy out. This one, you're going to throw that extra G away. Is that clear?
This is a real simple example to help me understand it. So, so let's take a look at some more details here about uh, these detonations. So go back again to the uh, Brayton and, and Humphrey cycles. And my point on this slide is, you know, we went over this at the beginning. If you have constant pressure combustion, you're going to follow this curve up to state three right here and then expand down. If you have constant volume, you follow a different path to a different state. And so the efficiency of the system depends on, you know, how you add the heat. That's why you get two different efficiency numbers for these, because the efficiency depends on how you put the heat in. It's that simple. So the question is, all right, if I'm going to put a detonation in there, how does it add the heat? That's the thing you got to understand to see the thermodynamics of this particular cycle. How does the detonation put the heat into the, the power cycle? So let's focus in on uh, the detonation itself. Um, I think probably the best coverage of, you know, explanation of, you know, what, what goes on in detonation is in Professor Law's book. I found it just really easy to read and helpful. So if you want to go home and read some more details on this, there's a citation right there. But, uh, you know, again, what happens here with a detonation, you've got this reaction front at this point. We'll get into the details of what's inside of there. And then behind there, everything behind there is gas dynamics, right? Isentropic gas dynamics. There's a rarefaction that follows. There's the head of that thing. It's actually moving off the page in that direction. It's getting longer. Uh, but behind that region, you essentially have a quiescent environment at high pressure. That's how that detonation moves down the tube. Here is a time distance plot of what's going on in that environment. Here's the detonation moving along the arc of that tube or along the length of that tube, expansion wave back in here. So if I have a particle of gas that's just sitting here, the detonation hits it, and then it moves over until its velocity drops down to zero, and then it just sits there until a rarefaction comes to push it out of the tube later on. Okay? So that's kind of the history of what's happening in that detonation. Well, what does the temperature entropy diagram look like for that particle going through the system? It's not so easy to answer. All right? So same diagram down below here. You know, this part you know, behind the detonation wave, that's just gas dynamics, right? So it's not hard to figure out, just method of characteristics, what's going on with the thermodynamics in that point, because you're not adding any heat. You're just changing it between velocity and pressure back to this region. So the real question is, what's going on inside there where the heat is added? Well, you know, the structure of a detonation, ZND, there's the acronym and the names, Zeldovich, von Neumann, and, and Doring. There's a shock wave that is initially leading the reaction. Then there's a short induction time right in there, and then the reaction occurs back behind that point. All right, so that's you know the structure that's going to be there in the detonation. So if I now try to answer the question, well, what happens to the particle? All I'm saying is right in here where the heat's getting added, what does the TS diagram look like? Not up in here. This is, the again, the gas dynamic part, the isentropic part. Well, from state two ahead of the shock wave, back to where the reaction is occurring, I mean, there's a shock wave in there. So it's not isentropic, right? I mean, there's an entropy bump up in that region. But exactly what happens at that point is, is hard to draw. That's why I show it here as a, you know, a dashed line, because it's, it's not a well-defined thermodynamic state to put on a TS diagram. And then you start adding the heat, you know, essentially at constant pressure at that point. So the gas is moving just subsonic, so it's subsonic heat addition, all right? So you're putting that into a moving flow. And if you go back, and I probably would have forgot this, but uh, you know, the temperature's gonna rise. And then right when you get to a certain point, uh, in terms of Mach numbers below sonic, the additional heat will actually, the temperature go down as it accelerates, all right? So this is Rayleigh heat addition. You can look it up in a gas dynamics book. The key point is the end state is different than constant volume combustion, or constant pressure combustion. Again, a different end state because you've added the heat differently. And that's my point, you know, as we're moving through this, with a, with a detonation, you're adding the heat in a different process, so you're going to have different thermodynamic availability at the end of the process. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. So just, just a couple of comments about that idea, because I, again, I just think this is instructive when you think about the thermodynamics of this cycle. 
there's, there's an interesting analog, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this twice, three, emphasize it again. It's not a perfect analogy. There are a number of problems with it, but just helpful for me to understand how does this detonation actually work. And I started thinking about this analog because when you read the literature, people talk about pulse detonation engine, rotating detonation engine, RDE, PDE, and other E's, engine, engine. And I kept thinking about it, and I thought, why do they keep calling it an engine? It's a combustor, right? Well, no, it isn't. It's an engine. So I just decided to make my own term up to capture them all and call it a gas dynamic engine. And the reason I like the phrase now, engine, is because you're taking the energy of combustion and you're producing useful work, and that's what an engine does. And it, it is amazing to think about how that shock actually works. There's a shock sitting out in front of the detonation that compresses the gas, and then the combustion releases heat. And then all that stuff back behind there, I says I dropped, you got that expansion back behind there that produces the thrust. Look at the analogy to what you actually do in a conventional gas turbine engine, all right? You compress, similar to that, add the heat, all right, and then do the expansion to get the work out. The only difference is here the work is coming out either as a static pressure or as the kinetic energy, the mechanical energy of motion. So that's why it's useful to call it a gas dynamic engine. It just it really is amazing to me that, you know, we have to put all the turbo machinery together to get that process. A detonation just does it by itself. Now it's not a perfect analogy, of course, because here in a gas turbine, compression is almost isentropic. Here it's far from isentropic, right? I mean it's a shock wave, you know, you're going through. But still, it's a helpful analogy because it helps you understand why you might think of a detonation as an engine. It makes work happen from that heat release. Uh, so interesting thought there. Uh, you can actually then uh, take that you know, detonation engine or gas dynamic engine and put it in as a replacement to this thing so it becomes a combined cycle. Is that clear? Because I'm saying you don't want to get the cycles all mixed up here. This is its own cycle that I'm going to now replace the combustor here, and then I have this now combined cycle, and that's how you might get even higher efficiency than a Humphrey cycle, which is purely constant volume. All right? Again, the point I'm trying to leave with, the detonation is even better than constant volume combustion. Constant volume combustion, remember, you just put it in a box and you throw away the exergy after that big kaboom. Right? Here with the detonation, you're converting you know, that chemical energy into mechanical energy, and if I'm smart, I can figure out how to do something with it later and use it in an engine. So with that phrase that I'm coining here today, maybe it'll get used, the cast dynamic engine, uh, it's helpful then to start to go through the literature on this stuff, and as you do that, you're going to find different uh, ideas about what to call, you know, my word, gas dynamic engine, thicket Jacobs cycle. There, there's a number of papers in the literature, they ignore the structure of that shock. It doesn't account for the compression before you go through the combustion. You still get good performance, but it's probably not a realistic picture of all the details of what's going on there. I'll give you the references here in just a moment. And then the other one is the ZND cycle, which I've just described here because it's the ZND shock structure that is actually the engine. So you'll see those words in the literature, and hopefully you've got a little bit now to understand what they mean. If you do get into this area, I want to caution you, because I know I've made this mistake. Uh, be really careful about identifying whether you're talking about stagnation or static properties, all right? Because there's a lot of kinetic energy in that flow. In fact, I, I'm an uh, editor for JPP, and I'm just looking at a paper, and one of the authors didn't really account for that. And boy, the reviewers just shoot the guy up. <laughs> All right, so you got to be careful on that very issue. All right, uh, unsteady adiabatic flow, the total enthalpy isn't constant. All right, and th you can just see that right here. Here's the, ch the for, a, for a following a Lagrangian particle, the change in enthalpy is it has this term, the change in pressure. So you have to account for that, obviously. It, it's just like when you're adding heat, right, then the total enthalpy is not constant. So you have to actually account for that, and sometimes you miss that in your thinking as you look at these cycles. So you, if you do work in this area, go back and take a look at those equations just to kind of help provide a frame of reference. All right. Uh, here, so here's some references. You know, I've talked about looking at a detonation versus constant volume combustion, and 
you know, these references, if you go through them, they come out maybe to different numbers and different approaches, but, you know, maybe one to three points better uh, efficiency adding a detonation versus purely constant volume heat addition. All right, so that's, that's a nice thing to know that you have something better to aspire to with a detonation than just pure constant volume. So, see if I'm communicating well here today. What practical issues could limit the actual advantage that you'd achieve? So this is a question for y'all. Anybody want to volunteer? What are some of the practical things that erode your ability to actually achieve that better efficiency from this detonation combustion? Go ahead. Let's see if I'll give you a minute here. Material limits in terms of your inability to, you know, put the thing together, not have, you know, the thing break down. And what else? Go ahead. Just. Yeah, and so and this is even even in pulse deflagration of what Dan Paxson was showing, right? You've got to design that ejector to actually capture that energy and not just lose it all going out the back end, right? And then if you say, well, I'm going to put ductwork in to carefully diffuse that frictional losses because it's got to be longer. So it's a good 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 point. Anybody else? Somebody else was saying something. Yeah, 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 that's exactly, yeah, that's why it's, it's a lot easier to go to the thrust than it would be to put it through a turbine, so go ahead. Oh, interesting question. Yeah, how do you do load following, right? So some people say, well, you could turn a couple tubes off. I, I, you know, I don't know about the load following capability, how broad it would be on a real PDE. Go ahead. Yeah, how to, exactly, right? I mean, you don't know, is this, is this going to be as stable as I'd like it to be in an engine that I've got to do load following with, right? I mean, that's a very good point. And then you even mentioned the detonation deflagration, right? How do I get consistent transition in the short possible time without losing all my energy that I've built up in there? So it's another issue. So, yeah, anything else? Anything from experts who worked this issue that we've missed here? Number of technical issues here. What's that? Yeah, yeah. If you were going to duck that in, then you've got to make the airfoils capable of. Yeah. It's a lot of issues down in that back end. For thrust, again, it's probably not at all an issue, right? For turbo machinery, maybe some problems in terms of how do you integrate downstream. So interesting technology. Let me go with my time there. Uh, you know, there are more details here uh, than I have time to talk about or that I, that I know about. Uh, I just want to make sure we mention them here today. You know, actual detonations don't travel as plane waves. All right, if you've ever seen, you know, and actually this thesis by uh, uh, Austin has actually got really nice photographs from, from Caltech. Uh, so, you know, a real detonation, if you have it in a tube, there's transverse waves that are coming in from the side and steadily colliding as they propagate in. And so, you know, I'm trying to show the path you know, that wave is coming in off the side at that point. And so it's, you know, pushed by the flow as well. And so there's two waves that are coming down and then they cross right at that point. So you're going to get pressure and temperature rise right there. And so you're going to get an acceleration of the chemistry in that Z and D structure. And so you end up with this irregular surface moving down that tube and you know in fact you've probably seen photographs of smoke foils where you can actually see the structure behind there so the wave is not as simple as I've described it all right there's a lot more going on and so it makes it hard a little bit hard to design for people who are trying to do de detonation I'm sorry deflagration detonation 
well, just think about what you got to do to predict that, right? You've got to start from a deflagration and predict that and then capture the transition out to a true detonation where the scale is on the order of, you know, the, the molecular interactions and the shock front and the chemistry behind it. So it's very hard to capture all that in a CFD code. Uh, but anyway, so there's some real issues in terms of the details of how do these waves propagate. And then the thermodynamic model, you know, if I want to capture what happens to the particles, their thermodynamics, right, I've got to know their history moving through all the, all the different portions of that wave front, right, because they have a different history. The ones in here went through a little bit higher pressure and their neighbors went through a little bit lower. How big an effect is that? I don't know, but you need to actually go down and track it and we'll see how you know, that's being done in a variant of this in just a minute. So a lot of details that we won't cover today. Uh, because of the complexities of some of that, uh, Razi Nalam at, uh, at Purdue, working with Rolls-Royce, he's pursued a little bit different approach. And uh, rather than going to a detonation, he's looked at a concept and I'm showing here a rotor that you know, moves that way. You can see, I hope you can see the channels that fit through that with a, an opening slot there and an exhaust slot down here, and this thing rotates. And so as these individual channels rotate into the inlet, the fuel and the air start to fill a channel, and then it's pushed off into this region where it's basically a closed volume, except it's sliding past those walls. And then there's a steady igniter at one end. So you start a flame at one end as that's passing by. The flame propagates. It's not a detonation, but it propagates quick down the end of the tube. So you now have constant volume combustion. And then as it spins around to the other side, it actually encounters the exhaust and dumps that out. So it's a mechanical way to achieve steady flow, but with constant pressure combustion. Really, you know, pretty innovative. I mean, if you're a mechanical engineer, it's like, wow, that's really very interesting. And, you know, it's sort of a variant of turbo machinery and, uh, you know, it doesn't have to spin, for example, with the turbo machinery. You're just using that as a way to, you know, create these combustion chambers going around. And uh, there, you can see they actually reduced this to practice and ran it. I have some movies somewhere, you know, where they did that first run, so just a few years ago there. But very interesting idea. Again, there's a lot of fundamental combustion that needs to be done to understand how do you, when you light that fuel air mixture at this end and it's in this high G environment, how do you get it to propagate all the way back down through to the other end and get good combustion efficiency? So uh, they've been actually doing studies and you can see a, an image looking through that slot, looking at uh, you know how do they validate code to predict the performance of that device. So a very interesting device. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up here in about the next 10 minutes and look at uh, an area that our lab is just starting to build one of these. We've got the build-up done. AFRL has done a lot more. Uh, they gave me most of these slides here. But this is rotating detonation wave, and again, the word engine. It's a combustor, but because it relies on detonation, I've explained why you call that an engine. So uh, the idea here is to, to have this detonation pressurize, but with a steady output that you could use directly for thrust, or you could put it in a turbine. So how do you make this steady? It's really interesting. Uh, here's the air coming out of the compressor going in the front end of this annular combustor, bunch of small holes here. The fuel and air are mixed at this front end, and the detonation wave actually travels around this direction. So it rotates around that region, and then there's an expansion as you're moving further down you know, out to the end of the thing. So you almost end up with steady flow out to the turbo machinery. The colors, I think, here are temperature or um, pressure. So you, you get a sense by the time you're down at the end, you've diffused that enough to where you actually have almost steady flow going into the turbo machinery. We're going to look at the details of what this looks like unwrapped in just a moment. So I won't, I won't get into the structure here right at this point yet. But just, uh, just to show, I think it's the next slide here. Maybe. There's what one of these actually looks like. This is from uh, uh, Scott uh, Cla Claflin at uh, uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne. So you're looking up the tail end of that RDE, and this is a diffuser cone. And of course, the, the combustion is going around the annulus right inside of that region. And I just thought this is a really nice photograph to let you see what it looks like. 
the next slide, yeah, here we go. Here are some images, one we borrowed from the Naval Research Lab. This was a simulation that they did a few years ago where you're looking at the, uh, the detonation propagating around that region. And the rotation rate here is pretty impressive, five kilohertz. Now, if you actually run this then in the lab and look at the side view going out this way, I'm sorry, the side view this way and then the end view looking down, that's what these two movies are. So let me see if I can get them started here without crashing my computer. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, you're all going to like, I want to see the movie. Okay. Let's do it this way. So here's the, uh, that's looking down the end, and you can see the detonation just zinging around there at 5 kilohertz. Uh, it, it's mesmerizing to watch. It's even more fun to think what's happening in there. You get this huge detonation wave flying around. Let me see if I got this one. This is the view looking up the end. Now this is more interesting because it almost looks steady. That's just a Schlieren photograph looking down the end. And uh, I can't remember the first time I saw this image. It was at a conference somewhere and just realized, man, you could put that into an engine. The flow is pretty steady. You don't have to worry about some of the issues we talked about with unsteadiness. So that's what it looks like. Let me get back onto my slides here. All right, so uh, again, I borrowed this from Fred's group, and I think some of the people who did this are this uh, uh, simulation are in the room. So if I get it wrong, guys, please help me out here. But what you're looking at is an image of the simulation of that annulus unwrapped. All right, and so what you can see, this is the detonation, and this is the actual region that's being filled running along this direction. So the fuel air mixture is coming up into that you know, sort of dark blue region right there. And the detonation is traveling along, consuming that. All right? And because it's an annulus, it just keeps going back on itself. All right? So here's the detonation, and the flow is coming back behind this way. There's obviously got to be a shock because you know, somehow you've got to get that high-speed flow decelerated. That's moving up in this region. There's a shear layer between the old and the new stuff that sits right there. Really interesting flow field, and I like the way they colored this because you can actually see the detonation cells. Remember I talked about? There they are, you know, from those transverse reflections. They're right there in the flow. You know, the interesting question, and uh, let's see, is it this one, this paper here, uh, Craig Nordeen, lead author there. I just thought this was a really interesting paper, and I'd recommend if you're starting to work in this area, that paper, because he actually gives a good explanation to think about how do you convert that rotating energy into useful work? You know, the flow is coming in basically through this front end in that direction, and the detonation comes by like a freight train and tips the flow. And so it's turned that flow, and that's where you've got, you know, mechanical energy. And he makes the point, it's a lot like a turbine blade. I thought that was a really great insight, you know, to think about how this actually works and how you get the conversion of chemical energy to mechanical energy by that detonation that's flying flying by. Well, there's a lot more to be done because you know, you've got to take this flow then and decelerate it and get it into turbo machinery, and that's really where all the fun is right now. How do we put this in an actual engine application? We're, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't the detonation travel upstream? Like, how fast are the reactants being flown fed into that? The, the detonation yeah, right why doesn't it go back? You have to come up with an inlet design it's diodic, just like we did with, with pulse deflagration. All right, and so how you do that, long story, but it's not an impossible job. I, I, I can't say too much on that right now for a bunch of reasons, but it can be done. All right, you could easily do it mechanically, right? All right, uh, there might be some other ways as well. Probably, I won't go too much further on that one. Anything else before I get off this picture? It's just interesting image to look at. Uh, we're working on this at our lab. As I said, we just, with, with Fred's help, uh, we've come up with a design that was just installed just a few weeks ago, and then we expand out in a uh, high-pressure combustion region. And because we're interested in ground-based power, we've got a couple things that are different probably than what other people are looking at. We've got to worry about emissions, right, because ultimately we'd have to permit these for ground applications. So we're setting up to take emissions measurements in that environment. 
another thing that's a little bit unique about what we're doing, we've got these other fuels that we're interested in. Well, detonation is pretty easy with hydrogen, not so easy with natural gas, right? It's a lot of, because methane is, is relatively unreactive compared to other fuels. Well, it turns out our program is probably more interested in coal syngas, at least the way our funding is, so that's okay. Uh, but we'd like to know, can you do this with natural gas? And so we're starting to take a look at some of those, some of those questions. Uh, we're also looking at the effect of operating this at different pressure, because our goal is to really integrate into a, you know, a combined cycle gas turbine. And so we've been doing some simulations with our colleagues at uh, WVU, looking at, well, how close can I get to the turbo machinery you know, vein cascade? without having a lot of reflections affect what I'm trying to do up in this region. And you know, these were just some posts we put into the simulation. You can see it's starting to interfere with the, the detonation structure. Looking at the area, the, the outline there is the Mach number contours for a low, low pressure case and then a high pressure case. You can see we're predicting a difference in the structure of what's in there. I don't know how good these simulations really are. They're not actually all that complicated simulation, just done with enough grid resolution. But we put them together, we're able to get a good prediction of the CJ velocity rotating around. So these need to be affirmed with uh, some of the testing that we're, we're planning on doing. So just before the break, uh, here is your thinking question. We already talked about really the first one. I, I stopped there for a moment and says, well, you know, what are some of the issues like with detonation that you'd have to worry about to put that into an engine cycle? So I want to focus on this second question, because this is one that I've been thinking about a lot and a lot and a lot. And, you know, if you're going to work this area, maybe at some future point, it's one to think about. What's the greatest challenge to development of this technology if you're going to put it inside a gas turbine? Not for thrust, but put it inside a gas turbine. And I'm willing to bet you might not say what, well, I'm willing to bet I'll say something different than you. Not that your answer won't be wrong, mine or yours will be wrong, but so just think about that for a minute biggest challenge to put it in an engine cycle. Anybody want to take a swing at it? Uh, just, there's probably a whole bunch of challenges, so it won't be bad. Biggest challenge to get in an engine cycle. Anybody? No? The volume to get it into the engine, yeah, because you're going to have to you know, fit it into the envelope of an engine that already exists, and we don't know yet what the geometry looks like. It seems like we could make the combustor small, because the energy release is very high in these devices. But what you have to do on either side of that for the inlet design and then for the exhaust diffusion, that's not defined that well yet. Then there's the question of the fuel introduction, like for Knox. There's a lot of issues in terms of design, how you fit it in. Anybody else take a shot? What do you think is going to be the big hang-up? Just look around one last time here. Well, this is one that, you know, as, as people, maybe you're starting your research, you know, you might not have thought of this one, but it's the one that's the biggest problem that I see, all right? This is a notional plot. The numbers are just qualitative. I couldn't find, there are actual plots like this, but I couldn't find one that's in the public domain. So let me tell you, let's take a look here at power generation classes, efficiency versus megawatts of power output. It turns out, you know, if you build a small turbine, maybe you've heard of, you know, some of these turbines for distributed generation applications, less than a megawatt. Some of these things are down at like 100 kilowatts or something. They have terrible efficiency, all right, because there's so much surface to volume loss with a device that size. So where do you put them? Where you want to do cogeneration, where you need the heat. You need a little bit of electric power, a lot of heat, go buy one of those. It's a great technology. But if you want to make, you know, electricity in a small package, you know, at a reasonable price tag, go get a reciprocating engine. Or you might even in the future be able to buy a fuel cell system for that size. You have very high efficiency in a small package. On the other hand, if you just want flat out efficiency, go build the biggest thing you can build, <laughs> right? Combined cycle power plant up here are 100 megawatts. Some are smaller than that. You know, simple cycle turbines are over in here. So if I was going to develop my rotating detonation engine combustor and try to get it commercialized into a power cycle, where would I start most reasonably? Well, unless I'm really brave, <laughs> I'm not going to go try to go before the board of directors and say, I only need $300 million to recore this engine on a technology that will give you 5%, maybe if we get it working right. Maybe. C can we do that? All right. Good luck. All right. You're going to inevitably be forced to start down in here, right? 
because you could probably get one of those engines for a hundred thousand bucks do the mods you need to stick this in there and try it out at that scale and maybe get it to work but there's no market for that i would just go buy a reciprocating engine you see my point to me this is this has got to be the biggest challenge with technology by the way i've talked to other people who make engines for a living and they're like yeah that's going to be the hold up so between now and when we reconvene after the break if you solve that I will give you five dollars. <laughs> all right, no questions asked. All right, come back and tell me. So there's your promise right before the break, and uh, we'll be back here at uh, 3:30. It'll be 20-minute break. 3:30.